general questions? Yes, I have a question for uh, for uh, Mari. Um, but uh, before I ask my question, I have to clear up some misunderstandings that may appear as I ask my question. So first of all, I'm a strong proponent of using models in biology, even though I feel uh, close to what Nitin Baliga expressed on the use of models and the use of models that are dedicated to a, a modeling a certain phenomenon for a certain purpose in a multi-scale way as needed for the to express uh, the uh, biological phenomenon. And the second misunderstanding I want to clear is that I, I very much admire the work that is done at CRG, and I think it's very useful. Now, I can come to my question. Um, basically, um, what I understand, so a bit of a caricature to make myself clear. What I understand is that uh, you have brought a lot of information that was useful to um, better calibrate the car and covered model the whole cell model of uh, mycoplasma um, so that you spend some time on that discussing with these guys uh, sending data, explaining the data and so on I'd like to know if you saved any time on your side using their model for, uh, your, uh, for to guide your own experiments Yeah, that's the final proposal of the whole cell model is try, try to have it as a tool for predicting or facilitating the work in the lab, but we haven't still used it. We are currently putting more efforts in having the optimal tool for doing that. So, so sh shall we say then that um, their model would be perfect um, if it were a scale one model? Uh, like the Emperor of China, you know, you, who asked, requested, because he was a powerful man and requested a, a scale one map of, of his own empire. Um, so that, uh, in some sense, you have the scale one model, because you're working on mycoplasma. They don't have this model yet, because they are using a, a virtual copy of it, which is imperfect. Um, would such a whole model be uh, good only at the time it makes 100% correct predictions, which will never happen in my opinion, and be useless until then? <laughs> so I don't think that it cannot be used at the state that it's done now, but our goal is try to track it in the best manner to try to reproduce simulations more orientated to the applications that we want to develop. In this sense, since we want to, to develop a defined media to optimal growth, we need to make an ODI model of the metabolism that is not currently developed and implemented in the whole cell model. To make all the whole cell dependent of the different components of the media and see how the changes in the media can affect the growth. So, at the end, it's depending on the application that you want to give to the model, the improvements that you have to do, and how to you, you want to use it. And I'm not saying that the current version that we have can be used for some prediction, like uh, if I delete a gene, which I would expect that the cell will grow faster or slower, you can do that. You can predict these modifications. But if you want to go in depth and study how I can engineer the medium and which are the modifications in the genome that I can do, so we are, we are still developing this for these proposals. You have a I just comment want here. to make a comment. I think it's not just true for, uh, for biology. If someone claims that mathematical modeling and simulation makes a correct prediction, he misunderstands the whole discipline. Because it only takes consequences from assumptions. And therefore, that's very... Uh, I never would claim to make a prediction uh, of this kind. I give you an example. So we have studied a lot of combustion theory and com modeling simulation, which used a lot. But if you have a single motor and you want to predict what happens in the world, it's not possible because your knowledge is not there. 
And the same thing is for population, uh, uh, populations of microorganisms, the same thing. But you should use it. Main, I'm very happy if I can improve an experiment. That's, and therefore, experimental design is a very important part which may help not just biologists, chemists, wherever you do it, you reduce your, uh, 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 you, you, you reduce your costs and your time to do experiments. I agree. The basis of all is the knowledge and also the interconnection between the people, the modeling experts and the experimental experts. So I think that nowadays you have a great, a great team and not great collaborators and hopefully one day we can merge all and have a proper system or, or model for that. We have a question. We want to produce something, mm. and you make in addition the network, the network yeah. dynamic because you optimize all on the structure. There is missing mathematics which can do it. It's uh, we try to look uh, look a lot on that. It, it, a, there is tools needed in, to solve this from a mathematical point of view. I think you're right. On the second place I've been told where. We may not have numerical methods is when you go across scales. So when you go from... This is something different. We have to discuss that, what you mean by that. But okay. keep the network, trust the network problem. There is not available a good systems reduction network for such optimization. It's a challenge to mathematics. Okay, in regarding the, your question about the bottom-top approach, I think that the characterization of different components in the system, in this case in our system, is good because like in the promoter studies, we now, we now could identify which are the signals or which are the best combinations of different signals, <coughs> level of structure or a level of sequence that we could use for expressing genes. Also, by the transcriptome analysis and studying in different conditions, we could identify uh, possible uh, regulators and how are they answering to different environmental conditions. So it's also information that can be applied to the design of genetic circuits. So, uh, and finally, if we could arrive to the moment of implementing all this information in a whole cell model, then we would expect that by studying different combinations of di this information at different levels, we could uh, like do an in silico design, is what we would like. And it's like a design of these circuits before testing in the lab. So it will be all gone, and um, hopefully one day we can do that. So I had a question about, um, uh, I guess for both, both of you, in terms of with the systems modeling, one question I had, and it was kind of struck by the syntropy example that was given, right, where you have two organisms, you're trying to um, get them to adapt to each other, but how much, I guess maybe my question is, how much, um, how much can you, or how much, how far away are we from being able to model systems evolving, right? So in other words, not a static system, right? But if you're talking about centropy, these organisms adapt to each other in terms of environmental conditions and so on, but then you let the system go. Um, modeling evolution is very difficult because when there's genetic change, it's, you, you can't. You, it's difficult to make predictions of what the, the consequences of genetic change. What you can do, however, is you could, in context of the metabolic fluxes and the dependencies of the two systems, you could find the constraints for uh, how that system could be set up in a way that you can have the right kinds of inputs. Um, so that you have optimal behavior. You can do that, but if there's a mutation in a regulated input that could improve that, it's difficult, if not impossible, to make a prediction as to what that might be. You might have a general, based on the principle, you might say that, for example, if I were to project this onto evolution of uh, an organism that is going back and forth between nitrification and denitrification, if, or a system that is going back and forth, I would say if the regulatory networks around denitrification enzymes are disrupted, that type of a fluctuation is better likely to proceed or evolve because regulation is not required of those genes, which is counterintuitive, but it's, but it's a principle you discover later. I see. <coughs> so 
also my, my concern, I know that the idea is very good and the proposal is good, but the problem is that we don't know how all the mutations will affect finally to the function of the different genes. So in the evolution process, at the end, you first need to know which is the impact of the mutations to know which will be the, 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 the advantages or which is the selection. No? So that's the main limitation, to use the models for predicting which will be the best evolution system. No, it, it comes a little bit to the question which we had before, a comment. We have to go from single cells to population. That's an upscaling which is terrible. Yes. You can imagine, you measure so much processes and receptors, all this stuff, and a single cell, the population, you cannot treat with this, with this preciseness. Impossible, because it's too huge space. But we have populations in real life. But they make predictions about populations. But this is dangerous. <laughs> they, <are extreme. laughs> they have mixed population. <laughs> so, sorry, it's the other way around. Experimentally, it's the other way around. It's easier to actually measure populations and get data on populations, and it's much more difficult to get data on things. But we, we ask the question if we go from information on a level, on a molecular level, in a cell. How do we explain? In an average cell. I agree that in terms of experimental data, the end what it's easier to obtain when you are doing omics, you are taking into consideration all the all the population, all the cells that you have in the cell. Population for single star mixers. But <laughs> that's true. Uh, we, we still don't know exactly which is the impact of having different cells in say the population. And also it's not the same the conditions in the lab that the conditions in the the real conditions in the infection process or whatever. So it's a lot of, there is a lot of work to do. But the multi scale is it? Yeah, the scaling up is really difficult. So to make you an example, we just tried to do chemotaxis for a population, uh, taking the information what inside the cell happens, and that's very complicated. It's not satisfactory for the biologist, but the first step. There's another question here. This is a point of view of a mathematician. So in all your talks, you have shown in a certain, certain part a regulatory network. So my question is the following. Do you think, in fact, that the organism is completely described by this huge graph with all these relationships? Because when you, from a logical point of view, with a regulatory network like that, you can do everything. So you can put 10 more nodes. So this means that these pictures, for example, like the popular one of the Krebs cycles with 1,000 entries that we, you can do nice calendars or nice posters. What is information that <laughs> is okay. there? So at the end, you realize when we choose mycoplasma because it's very simple, it has a very low number of genes, and you expect that you can characterize properly the different elements and components and see what is the crosstalk between the different biological processes. But at the end you realize that there is a, a, lot, there are a lot there is a lot of complexity because at level of regulatory network is not only the transcription factors. Because the, the transcription factors we could explain only I mean ten percent of the effects that we were observing when we were studying the transcript on different conditions. So we studied around three hundred conditions where we were exposing the cells and we were observing changes in gene expression. But when we were relating these changes with the transcription factors, only ten percent of something of this could be explained by this. So there are other elements. And then it's when we were studying also the structure of the chromosome and we realized that the supercoiling of the DNA in some regions is also important. But then, what regulates these changes in the supercoiling also, and how it's changing or how it's modulated? So, there are several factors independently of the regulatory network, so the complexity is very high. So, the ideal case would be if we could study properly the connection between the different pathways and the different networks to really understand properly the system. So, that's the code. Well, and we think that by using mycoplasma, which is simple, we could rise this level of knowledge, but at least we could establish like the basis to, to later develop these models and to simulations more accurately. Because when people do mathematical models with these regulatory networks, then when you describe interactions, for example, regulation or the repression interaction with the sewer 
can use very different type of models. You can use repressivator models, max action law based models. And for any choice you do, you have a completely different output. And if for the same network, for the same graph, if you do a choice of a repressivator type of interaction like that, or a Michaelis type, the output is completely different. So, do you have uh, this type of experiment when you do the, your type of your simulation of you when you compare your simulations with reality? At the end, you have to do what you said: compare with reality. You have to compare with experimental data and see which is the one that is fitting better to the results of the modeling that you are doing. So, depending on the, you can do the simulations using different kinds of modeling, but at the end, the one that you consider that is the proper one is the one that is fitting better with your experimental results that are theoretically reproducing the physiology of the system. Yeah, so this poses me to some kind of ontological problem. So at one side you have mathematical work and you have the experiment, you have your, your ideas, you take your piece of reality, you ask mathematicians to do something. And at the end, this thing has some kind of, uh, kind of interpretation, so you, you must to <laughs> repeat experiments to see if everything is, goes like the model or not. So why the work of mathematicians, why the work of the model in this, this approach? So at the end I think that uh, the, it's extracting new information from the model. Yeah. Yeah. So that finally you need to corroborate. But it's easier to corroborate something that you have an evidence, that's something that you have to start from blank point. I mean, when you are experimentalist and you want to test an hypothesis, you can have 100 type of hypotheses. You have a way to discriminate them and establish which are the ones or which are the priorities. It facilitates a lot of work. So I think that at the end, it's, it's good that you have this interplay between mathematics and also experimentalists. No? Yeah. I have a very general question, probably not only to you, but for all who is in term about models. Uh, all these network-based models, all these data-based models, how robust they are to hidden information. So they are based when <coughs> we are known. We will work, but two years later we will, new we will have new methods, we will add some new information. How robust are our two-day models to this unknown, still unknown information? How it will potentially change uh, the results of modeling. It will change exactly, but uh, how um, did somebody measure it? I don't know. I mean, we do measure, and I think there's, there'll always be more information that you can incorporate. But if you if you are trying to predict a certain phenomenon, you can look at how close you get to predicting actual observations, and do new experiments to to see what the error is. And within the scheme of what you know, if you get close to the, the observations, I think your model is doing well, although it may not be completely mm -hmm. mechanistic. No, no. What, I, what I mean, for instance, we have several functional models. No, for instance, DNA repair cell cycle, mm -hmm. that is closed from mucosine, from cancer biology. Yes? We know some connections between uh, cell cycle and DNA repair mechanisms, and we are making some predictions for drug discoveries, for instance, etc. Two years later, we will we will find some new mechanisms which are connected. Uh, probably, we, we, we can find some new mechanisms, some new uh, interactions which are connected with two models. How will it change uh, uh, potentially? This, uh, because I know that uh, that is uh, when people are measured uh, robustness in some. Uh, Statistical models, they, they, add, uh, they accept some data, yes, and when, che and when test, the result the same. Probably we should add some potential unknown information. If we will share, add some potentially possible information uh, about non-existing non uh, interactions, non-measured interactions, to test are our models robo uh, quite robust. Could some new information about interactions between these functional models dramatically change results of our modeling? Well, I, I think that what I would remark here is that the models are database dependent, so you have always there the information of all the components of the model and also all the reactions, so you can always add new reactions, always that you know them, 
and when you know the function or how they acting or the interplay between different elements, you can see, you can include them in these databases and then see which is the impact in the model. I agree that the then you have to test the robustness of the model and see which is the impact of these modifications and probably you will end up doing new experiments to corroborate it. But uh, we enter in the topic of standardization also that I think that is one of the of the also the topics in all the areas of research. No, do we have any uh, standards in modeling? And uh, when you are uh, working with different kinds of modeling, are we using all the same languages? Are we using all the same uh, and a standard way to to do to later on modifications in these models? So we are trying to 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 find a way to, to standardize this and to have all the database external from the model so that you can only change some parameters or add some features and then, then this model could simulate or reproduce the, these changes and how they affect. Okay. And we go for a final question because we are getting close to the end of the session. The, the concept of the experiment in biology. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same as the experiment in physics. I've, I have a lot of, um, I've done a lot of work in Drosophila with uh, analyzing experimental data. And the group in New York, Reinitz Group, they have done the following. They, keep, they do the same experiment repeatedly. And the output is, uh, is completely different. It's called phenotypic mm. variability. <coughs> And you have analyzed this data, and the, the, you know very well the genetic network. It's only simply a network with um, 12, no, 12 uh, uh, genes, or whatever you want to call them. So we have the protein and the RNA, and all type of interaction, but we have only a very small network. And what we have seen is that for each, each, each experiment, you do everything in the same thing, and the output is different. So, when you have one experiment to establish one arrow in your network, you have a problem. In physics in general, we say that when you prepare an experiment and the initial conditions are exactly the is the temperature it is, you have the same output. Here you have phenotypic variability, you have other questions. Then, you begin to make models for this. And what happens is the following. In general, you say that if, if you have a system with some fixed number of parameters, if you change the parameters, the output will be different. So what you have found is exactly the following. You have in the space of parameters of these networks, you change, there is a lot of, you can change the parameters and the output is the same. It remains unchanged. And the parameters are real significant, very important parameters. So, so I have this problem. When you, when you do an experiment, how, how do you, you make a specific, uh, a very exact relationship between the input and the output? So wh when you have, because you don't know in fact very well the system, w when you have this engineering approach that you have input, black box in your slides, mm -hmm. the output, this is behind of this. It's, uh, the engineer thinks and the physicist he thinks that if I change the input, I get something on the output that is different, or if it is not different, so I throw away this parameter. But in biology, it's not like that. And the experiments, as far as I know, the only group that keep on repeating these experiments is this Heinrich for Drosophica, because everything is very, very well known. For each experiment, for example, for one protein, Bicoid, we have about 1,000 experiments of uh, distribution of Bicoid, and the results are always different. So. When you do an experiment, you repeat your experiment or not? You keep on repeating. <laughs> 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 we are always doing replicate, biological replicates, technical replicates in, in order to have reproducible results. I agree that sometimes you have a lot of variability, but in the case of, of bacteria, it's more reproducible. I think that it's also linked with the complexity of the system. So, so we know so viral and eukaryotic cell lines, you have epigenetics, or moreover, you have a lot of modification, professional yeah, modifications one more. that are not linked to the genome or to the, just the condition that you are applying. One more consideration that we think is important, because you said that, is about 
when you say biologists say two words, I, I am always afraid. It's a word of optimization. For me, I travel. And uh, the, oh, the word oh, to, to have a standard, to have some uh, kind of thing like that. Because in optimization, suppose you want to make uh, travel, could you travel from, let us say, Paris to London. You can optimize <coughs> on the fuel and you can optimize on time. Both optimizations are completely different. In biology, you have 10,000 genes, I don't know, for example, in your case, 700 genes. What the animal, dependent of the environment, he optimizes how many, how many genes. For example, he optimizes for three or five objectives. So you have a Pareto front, you don't have a, a unique solution. The solution is enormous, so enormous space of solutions. So when you try to make a kind of, you say the word optimization, optimization, so you have only one parameter, optimization is well, only well defined for one parameter. If you have two, it is not that. It's not well but if you have two minimum mm -hmm. functions, you cannot optimize for the minimum functions. Well, so I, I have these I problems also for the... We had a very lively discussion on uh, limits and challenges of models. We ended up with limits and challenges in biology to repeat experiments. <laughs> I will add on this maybe a bit later. We have also on, on Monday the, the question on standardization of experiments by Paul Freeman. It's the same it goes into the same direction, I think. Uh, I would like to close the session and thank the audience for the questions and also, of course, our speakers. <laughs>